Hello everyone, we're in for a post-landing briefing with the Mars Perseverance rover. It landed on Mars earlier today, and now there's a briefing happening one and a half hours after it landed. So, let's get into it. It seems like the program hasn't started yet, but I'll get skip to it once it starts. Hello, and welcome to NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Southern California, where we have just landed the most sophisticated and most capable rover yet on the surface of Mars, the Perseverance rover. I'm Jari Cook of JPL's Digital News and Media Office, and I'll be your host today as we gather reactions from our key players from the landing and also give a glimpse of what's to come. So because of the coronavirus pandemic, everything's gonna look a little different today. We have our masks on and the layout is a little different, but I wanna introduce our speakers to you. So standing on the floor of Von Karman Auditorium, we have Steve Jurisic, NASA's Acting Administrator. We also have Mike Watkins, the Director of JPL. And then we also have John McNamee, Perseverance's Project Manager. Up on the stage, we have Thomas Zerbukin, NASA's Associate Administrator for the Science Mission Directorate. We have Lori Glaze, NASA's Planetary Science Director. We have Matt Wallace, the Perseverance Deputy Project Manager, and Al Chen, Entry, Descent, and Landing Lead. Ken Farley, the Perseverance Project Scientist. And then coming from our Surface Operations Area, we have Jennifer Trosper, Deputy Project Manager. And over here, we have a special group on our video conference. We have a group of the Perseverance team members. Um, all right, so we are gonna be taking questions during this briefing. So if you're a member of the media and you're on our phone lines, press star one uh, and you'll be put into the queue. And if you're on social media, uh, use the hashtag Countdown to Mars. But before I turn, it over, turn over the podium, I just wanted to take one minute to recognize what a thrilling day today has been. We now have the most ambitious rover yet on the surface of Mars. Congratulations. All right, I'm going to turn the podium over to Steve Jurisic. Wow, I mean, just just an amazing, incredible day. Um, I could not be uh, more proud of the team and what they've what they've accomplished under uh, under challenging circumstances. I also have to tell you that about an hour after landing, I got a phone call from the President of the United States, and uh, and he, his first words were, "Congratulations, man." And I knew it was him. I wasn't getting talked. But <laughs> only only the president could say congratulations, man. He um, he he talked about um, how proud he was of what we had accomplished, um, and he wanted me to. I wanted me to send my his regards to Percy, and he wanted to congratulate the team. He wanted me to congratulate the team for him. He does want to congratulate the team personally, and I told him we will make that happen. And so, um, looking forward to having the. President of the United States, congratulate the team this week. Um, you know, nine successful landings on Mars. 
Um, the only nation that's been able to do that. Just, just incredible. Um, thousands of people working on this to make this happen at the Jet Propulsion Lab, at NASA centers, with our industry partners and with our international partners. I want to call out one of our other government agency partners. The Department of Energy develops the radioisotopic thermal generators for us, the RTDs, that power curiosity and are powering uh, perseverance. And it's a great partnership, so thank you to our DOE colleagues. Um, you know, this, this, this mission is amazing on its own. Science, technology, and caching samples bring back to Earth. But it's also part of our bigger exploration plans, right? Which involve really understanding Mars and the evolution of Mars and whether there was life, ancient life, um, but also preparing uh, for eventual human missions to Mars. And so this is one step along the way of our journey to accomplish that goal. And it's a major step. And we've embarked on that. We've taken the first steps in embarking on that journey. Um, you know, again, I just, I just am, a, I'm amazed that, um, that, uh, that everything went, uh, you know, pretty much according to plan. And um, when I, I heard the touchdown signal come back and saw the first image, um, I, I cannot tell you how um, overcome with emotion I was uh, and happy I was. I didn't get a lot of sleep last night. I think I'm going to get sleep really well tonight. <laughs> so again, just, just an amazing day. Um, with that, I would like to turn it over to my colleague and friend, Dr. Zabukin. Well, thanks so much, Steve. And uh, I want to share an, an event with you, with you that usually happens when I'm by myself. And what you should know is that every time we do a launch or we do a landing, we get two plans. One plan is the one we want to do, and then there's that second plan, which is right here. That's the contingency plan. Here is for the contingency plan. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Just about one and a half hours, a little bit more, history happened right here. And uh, I want to play a video that the team put together. Before I do so, I want to just warn you, you may or may not, in the last row, see some uh, uh, bent COVID protocols. Uh, you should just know that all of us who are involved back there were doubly masked and normally had all the distance in the world. But, but uh, you know, I will tell you later about my emotions there, but I, I had to hug some people. Uh, sorry for that, uh, Steve and, and, and everybody, but uh, roll the video, please. Let's lift back that moment we had. Go ahead. We are starting to straighten up and fly right maneuver in preparation for parachute deploy. Yes. Yes. The navigation yes. has confirmed that the parachute has deployed and we're seeing significant deceleration. Sky can maneuver has started. About 20 meters off the surface. We're getting signals from it, and we roll. Touch on confirmed. Perseverance yeah. safely on the surface of Mars. Ready to begin seeking the sand of half life. Looks like we're getting the first image. Uh, what an amazing moment. I have to tell you. After I was kind of reacting the first five seconds or so, I was overcome with emotions, frankly, in the back there, and I was tearing up. And then, frankly, what I thought about is a statement that was made 20 minutes or so before the moments you just saw, when one of the leaders said, this is the first time for months that we're all in the same room, and I want to thank you for being here and being part of the team. Of course, many individuals uh, on the monitor here and otherwise and we're not in that room. And I just wanted to tell you how proud and so moved I was by that team achieving that amazing success. I was reminded of uh, a statement of a famous coach who once asked, was asked, what are the three most important things that create success in the game? And it turns out the same is true for NASA. And here are the following three in the order of priority, the team, the team, and the team. And I just really want to thank the team for that. Thanks so much.
Of course, for me, this is not an end, but a beginning. Uh, now the amazing science starts, you know, and I just, I'm so looking forward to the science that's coming, come there. Every yard on the surface of Mars is a yard of Mars sample return to go collect these precious samples and bring them back to Earth. And of course, you should know that one of the first texts I got from the international community was from my friend David Parker, my colleague over in ESA, who sent his congratulations. I just want to tell him back how excited we are to continue to work with them on this amazing joint mission, this international history-making mission that we're now endeavoring, of course, with perseverance right there. But as we're already starting to develop, some of the team members moving over towards Mars sample return. And many concrete steps are also happening, of course, towards another horizon goal, which is human exploration of Mars as well. You know, I always think of it as like there's a whole bucket of miracles you need to achieve to do that. And we're taking some miracles off the table, both today, but also as we go forward with uh, Mars sample return. So the future of Mars exploration is just so broad and exciting and it involves many other nations as well. And uh, leaders, uh, many of them are still in school or even in kindergarten or, or, or younger. And those leaders we're gonna need as we do this amazing, achieve those amazing goals. I wanna think of the international partners of uh, Mars 2020 Perseverance. And we had something like 35 vendors from 11 nations that of course added up to the nearly thousand within the United States. 11 nations that included a lot of them and I've been in some of these nations and I know where these pieces are coming from and how proud those nations are. Of course, over and above that, we have three partners that have contributed instruments, France, Spain, and Norway. And I had texts from our French colleagues, for example, where the prime minister was right there with the team and celebrating with them. I'm just so glad for the support in each one of those countries they're receiving from their governments. And we look forward, but each of, our contributions, the contributions internationally and the ones by the team here will provide information and, and tell us about Mars and also the future collaboration that will be enabled by the amazing historic feat today. Mars is always hard. We don't take this for granted. Landing on Mars is one of the toughest things, even though the team, you know, is making it look easy. I have to tell you, I mean, I, it's just incredible to me. I've baffled, you know, I, I told Steve this morning, you know, I had to get up in the night twice to replace a sweated through wet t-shirt with a new one. I was telling myself I'm pretty calm. Apparently my body did not say so. But uh, this next night, I, I'm sure I only need one of them as we go forward. And that's uh, in no small uh, way because of my next friend I'm gonna introduce you to you, which is of course, Mike Watkins, who's the JPL director. Take it away, Mike. Thank you, Thomas. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone virtually to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory here. Uh, this room, uh, many of our journalist colleagues have been in this room for a landing day where we've actually celebrated all of the Mars landings uh, ever accomplished by humankind uh, here in this room. And I miss the fact that uh, you're not all here uh, with us today. We usually have the lab buzzing with uh, thousands of folks. And uh, because of COVID, we're doing this remotely. Uh, but I hope you still feel a part of this and, uh, and certainly feel free to engage us uh, you know, with questions and follow up. Uh, on behalf of JPL, I, I have to say we have a fantastic project team, no question about it. And John McNamee and Matt Wallace will talk a lot more uh, about that team. But I wanna also notice the rest of JPL. It really took a lot of folks working together uh, to make this mission successful. And of course, we're working on missions other uh, than uh, Mars Perseverance as well. And uh, we had to keep those missions going. We had to keep Mars 2020 going. Uh, we had to use our CIO office to make sure we could all work uh, uh, in a virtual sense, work remotely. Uh, and of course, folks keeping uh, everyone safe on the lab in terms of, of PPE and facility changes. And uh, you know, we sort of had to change the tires while we we're going down the highway uh, starting last year. And uh, you know, we are very proud of, of having um, been able to, uh, to make 2020 a success. And now that Perseverance uh, is on the surface, uh, I hope you are sharing the magic uh, that I do personally 
Uh, these first few days on Mars, uh, I always think in some sense are the most magical. Uh, all of the great panoramas and the color photos and great science and our sample acquisition and the helicopter flight, uh, you will follow along with those uh, and see them uh, in the coming months. Uh, but there is something special about the first few days because we have just landed a representative of the planet Earth uh, on a place on Mars that no one has ever been to. No one has ever seen it except from orbital imagery from a few hundred miles up uh, above Mars. And uh, I believe that that magical sense uh, that we bring is a lot of the reason that JPL exists and NASA exists. And uh, I and everyone at the lab uh, is very proud to be, to be part of that. And now to talk more about what we expect to do with this mission on the surface, uh, now that we are safely down, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Lori Glaze, the head of the Planetary Science Division at NASA headquarters. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mike. Really appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, I, just wow, right? I, there's just so much uh, excitement and, and emotion here today. And, and I, I, of course, have to um, extend my thanks as well um, to the entire team who really had to work under uh, adverse conditions over the last year, but um, have worked hard uh, for the six years prior to that as well, um, and, and probably even before that, uh, <laughs> leading up to, to the beginning of the, when the project got kicked off. Um, I'd also like to, to make sure I, I give a little shout out and some thanks to, to my headquarters staff that support this as well. Um, you know, we, we all work together, it's all one, one big team. And, and I, I wanted to tell the folks here, the, the, the Mars 2020 team, uh, that it was just such an honor to, to be here and be allowed to sit in the control room with you guys. Y'all are incredible, you're amazing. Um, and I know it wasn't even the full team there and the full breadth of that team, uh, the capabilities are, are just astounding. And, and so I'm just so proud of everything you've accomplished and, and you know, thank you for letting me be a part of it here today. Um, it is really, truly exciting. You know, the, now that we're on the ground, um, now the fun really starts. And I loved, uh, you know, you're gonna hear, hear from Ken in a little bit. Um, we're talking to him right after landing and then, you know, the science team's already getting started. They're already working. You know, Ken's in there looking at the pictures. Uh, the first two that we got down and he's already, uh, you know, looking at them and, and trying to figure out, you know, what we're gonna do and where we are. So, fantastic. I can't wait to get all the instruments turned on over the next uh, several days and weeks um, and start uh, collecting data. Um, in, and in particular, over the, you know, the next few days as we're, we're getting down all of the, the imaging and the microphone data that were taken during the descent. Uh, you know, I think it's gonna take us all along on that descent. We're all gonna get to experience just exactly what that was like. This will be the first time we've ever had that opportunity to not just look at the, the data that came back and said, yes, the parachute deployed and yes, you know, the, the sky crane operated correctly. We're gonna get to see it and live it and participate every one of us on that way down. It's gonna be amazing. So. Really, really looking forward to that. Um, I'd also like to, uh, in my time here, uh, give a shout out to the uh, more than one million students that uh, joined in for the uh, Mars Student Challenge. And I wanna, I wanna thank you all for, can we all thank the students that yeah. participated? Uh, Fantastic. We're just so excited that uh, so many young people around the country and around the world have, have gotten engaged with this mission. Uh, it's incredibly inspiring. And as Thomas said, it's, it's your generation that's going to take us forward. It's your generation that's going to be uh, analyzing these samples when they come back to Earth. And we're just uh, so happy to have uh, so much of uh, so much interaction with, with the students. And, and the, uh, the Mars challenge, the student challenge is still up there and folks can still sign up and still participate um, in that activity. So just continue to, to participate. So with that, um, I am going to pass things over uh, to John. Um, thank you so much, John McNamee, who is our project manager and congratulations, John. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lori. Um, so I woke up this morning um, unlike uh, Thomas and Steve, I slept uh, like a baby, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, got a little exercise, uh, had uh, a little breakfast, um, landed on Mars. Uh, so all in all, pretty good day so far. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason I slept so well is I, I probably closer knowledge than uh, uh, Thomas, uh, um, 
and Steve and, and Lori of the quality of the team that was brought to bear on this uh, very, very difficult endeavor. Uh, and I'm talking about the ex uh, very much extended uh, team uh, that doesn't just include JPL. Uh, we got tremendous support from Na uh, NASA headquarters, uh, from JPL management, uh, the technical establishment that exists here uh, at JPL in the technical divisions, but also um, in industry, uh, uh, the other NASA centers that uh, were brought to bear on this project are international partners and uh, a, a, you know, a wealth of contractors uh, that contributed uh, greatly uh, to the, the success of this mission. Uh, so we all celebrate it uh, together, together uh, for sure. Um, it was a very difficult task uh, that we asked people to do. Uh, they delivered, uh, they tested, uh, and we landed. And now uh, we have turned it over to the operations team, you'll hear from Jennifer Trosper here in a minute, and the science team, you'll hear from uh, Ken Farley in a minute. Um, and they have, uh, now they have a job to do, I mean, a real job to do now that we put this down on, on the surface. Um, I know that the um, surface team uh, and the science team um, were anxious for us to get there. And then as we started to get there, they go, oh my God, they're actually gonna get there. If we need to finish doing what we need to do to operate this rover. Well, they did that, and they'll start doing In fact, they're doing it as we speak right now. So anyway, uh, thanks to all who contributed. Uh, I would argue that if you looked up perseverance um, in the dictionary, you should see the faces of all of these people uh, that are on the screen here and all of the people on this panel. So uh, thank you very much. I'm going to turn it over to... Uh, my partner in crime um, and uh, the person I called the conscience of the project, uh, for essentially from the get-go, uh, Matt Wallace. Thank you very much, John, and, and thank you for your, your leadership. It's been a pleasure working with you the last uh, eight years, I have to say. Um, you know, you just got a chance to watch this team do one of the hardest things we do in our business, which is to land a spacecraft on the planet. Mars. You know, we arrived at Mars moving at about 12,000 miles an hour, roughly, and just seven short minutes, we had to slow down and, and gently put Perseverance down in Jezero Crater, and uh, and uh, the system just performed uh, flawlessly. You know, uh, get through 10 or 12 Gs of deceleration, a supersonic parachute deployment. Uh, you know, eight big main engines had to fire. Our terrain relative navigation hazard avoidance system had to perform the way it was designed. And, uh, you know, it's just, a, it's never easy. Uh, these things are so complicated. Uh, we were running a couple million lines of flight software code. I think we had something on the order of 30,000 parameters to set and get them all right. Uh, you know, just a, it's just a, a difficult thing to do. And uh, it's, it's a real, um, uh, very gratifying and quite a relief <laughs> to be through it, I have to say. Uh, and the good news is I think the spacecraft is in, in great shape. Um, we got through EDL uh, very well. Al Chan will give you a little more information about that. Uh, we did transition into our surface mode as we expected to, and, um, and so we're doing well. We do have a couple images. I'm going to pop these up, I think, on the screen. If you can bring up our Hascam imagery. Uh, these are engineering camera uh, images that are taken out the front of the vehicle and the rear of the vehicle when we land. And that's Jezero Crater right there. And uh, you can see the shadow of the vehicle uh, and you can look out into the horizon. And uh, that, is, uh, that is just uh, a great thing to see for the team. So, um, so the next thing we're gonna do here is something we've never tried before. Uh, in addition to landing at Jezero Crater. Um, we have never tried to bring the team into uh, our press conference here, and we want to try to do that. So, are you guys ready out there? Comms team ready? You guys ready to try this? Okay, I think I'm getting some nods up and down. All right, here we go. We're going to try to switch over uh, and introduce you to the uh, Mars 2020 Perseverance team. Here you go. Congratulations, team. Hey. 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 
Computers. They built the structures. They built the radars. Uh, they integrated the prop tanks and the thrusters and all the engines. Uh, you know, they built actuators and robot arms and sampling systems. Uh, these guys uh, just just never never rested. All of our terrific inst science instruments, our our technology payloads, uh, really a, a remarkable team, uh, and they did it. They did it, you know, days, they did it nights, they did it weekends, they worked through holidays, uh, they worked first shift, second shift, third shift, uh, just a remarkable, um, you know, a remarkable uh, accomplishment, and we're so proud to be part of uh, what, what they've done here. And they look good, they look good on TV, I think, you know, so I think you hopefully you got to see some some of the faces and uh, some of the families, uh, maybe a few signs, a couple pets <laughs> along the way. Uh, but congratulations uh, to, the, to the whole team and thank you all for everything you've done. I'm gonna turn it over to Al Chen. He is the lead of our swashbuckling EDL team and he's gonna tell you a little bit more about entry, descent, and landing. Thanks, Matt. Uh, you know, wow, that was uh, quite a ride. It never gets old uh, landing on Mars and uh, I want to tell the whole project team thank you, and especially to the uh, to the EDL family out there. I'm really proud of you. Uh, you guys did it. Um, I can show you a little bit about uh, what we know so far. Uh, it usually takes us a couple of days to figure out where we went, but with our side benefit of our train route and navigation system, uh, we know pretty well where we went. Uh, if you bring up the first figure, you can see that uh, we're off the center just a little bit to the southeast, uh, about a kilometer, 1.7 kilometers or so to the southeast. Um, uh, it's a pretty good area, uh, but uh, terrain relative navigation was pretty important here. Uh, if you go to the next figure, and not just for telling us where we are, uh, you can see that we landed in you know an area that's relatively rugged there. Um, and uh, I think uh, Ken will be able to tell you about the science of what's there. Uh, but I was just worried about what would uh, what would kill us on landing. So if you go to the next slide here, uh, red is generally bad, um, and you can see that the uh, the system managed to find a nice blue spot in the midst of all that red. Um, all that uh, all that death that's out there for us. So we found a parking lot and uh, and hit it. So, um, you know, the train relative navigation system was absolutely essential uh, in getting us down here and helping us figure out where's, where we are right away. Um, we are in a nice flat spot. The vehicle is only tilted by about uh, 1.2 degrees. Um, so uh, we did successfully find that parking lot and have a safe rover on the ground. And uh, I couldn't be more proud of my team for doing that. Um, and that's... Really all I gotta say. <laughs> I think uh, this is the end of my journey, I guess, with, uh, with perseverance, but the, uh, the, the adventure really, the mission is really just beginning. Uh, so let me toss it over to Jennifer to talk about the surface uh, work that we have ahead of us. Thanks, Al. Well, thank you, Al. I mean, you and your team did a fantastic job and we're so grateful to be in this position. I almost feel like I'm in a dream. Our job is to think of all the bad things that can happen and try to avoid those. And when all good things happen, you feel like you're dreaming. And I'm happy to feel like I'm dreaming today and uh, happy to be here. That I want to first, I want to do the most important thing, which is introduce you to another portion of the team. Some of these folks were downstairs for landing and some of them are up here uh, just doing surface operations. And so the team wants to share their excitement with you about being on the surface of Mars getting ready for an amazing science mission. So thank you, team. This team is awaiting the Odyssey overflight. Yeah, let's give them a hand. Thank you, folks. So this team is awaiting the Odyssey overflight, which will happen about 4 or 4.30 p.m. It's a very small data volume, so we won't get very much information. But then at uh, 6.30 p.m., Trace Ga Gas Orbiter We'll have an overflight and send down a fair amount of data. And that's, I think, what everybody's looking forward to are these images that Mike talked about. So the images we might get in, the, if everything goes well, 
We will likely get the HasCams with the deployed covers. What you were looking at before was the HasCams without the covers deployed. We hope that we will get some thumbnail movies of some of the EDL camera images, so that front row seat and entry descent and landing. And then it's possible that we'll get an actual image from the descent downlink camera, the last 10 meters before we landed on the surface. So we're all on the edge of our seats looking forward to getting those images. Just a few other stats about the rover. We think we're facing southeast based on the shadows, about 140 degrees. The tilt, as Al said, is it's flat. It's about 1.2 degrees. The, the power system looks good. The RTG, um, the generator, before we landed was at 105 watts, and we think it'll go a little higher. The batteries are charged at 95%, and everything looks great. So we are excited to get the next set of information from Perseverance. Now, the team will get some images tonight, but then over the next few days, we spend a little bit of time I'll show you with the model here, kind of unwrapping the rover. It's been inside the descent stage back shell. So the mast is not deployed, so we will deploy the remote sensing mast here. And then we'll also be pointing, you can see here, the high gain antenna at Earth, and that's how we will communicate. Right now, the rover is sending data through the orbiters on an antenna, a UHF antenna that's sitting here on the back of the rover. Uh, and we can command it, but only through uh, an omnidirectional low gain antenna here, so we don't get very high data rates through that. So we're excited to be opening up the rover over the next few days. After that, we will transition the software. As John mentioned, we were finishing. Um, many of these people have been working on this mission for years, um, and we were finishing the surface flight software as we were flying to Mars. It's on the vehicle, but we will spend a little bit of time transitioning to that software. Then we will finish the checkouts of all the instruments and we'll drive to our heli flight demo location, wherever that might be. Now we're in, an, I spent a little time talking to the rover planners, the folks who decide where to traverse and what's safe and what's not. And there's a ripple field in front of us between us and the Delta. Uh, so we might be doing some driving around the, the ripple field. We don't like sand ripples that much, but we're going to spend some time and figure out what the traverse places are and, and where the helicopter demo fl flight should be. So that's what we're working on. Uh, in, in summary, I would like to say, you know, as I step back, it's just, it's great to be able to share this success. I'm so happy for the team who has worked so hard. This is an incredible team and they have just pushed through so many challenges. But we're also very excited to be able to share this success with everybody who is cheering for us, everybody who is watching. We really are excited for you to join us on this great mission on Mars that we're gonna go through in the next several years, learning more about Mars. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Ken Farley. He'll talk more about the science mission on Mars. Hi, thanks, Jennifer. Uh, I would follow on what uh, Steve Jerzyk said. I would say, wow, we have a science mission. It has been a long road to get here. And one of the things I would point out, uh, it may be not obvious from the outside, but um, a mission like this is, is a lot like a decade-long relay race. There was the whole first stage where the, the whole spacecraft was designed and built and literally, as the pandemic was closing in, was raced off to the Cape to make the launch. The second leg was to get through space and arrive successfully, as we have just done. And the third leg is the one that we are about to embark on. That's the science mission. And one of the amazing things about this is there are thousands of people all along the way, and at each step, those people peel off and move on to new jobs. And so on behalf of the science team, I wanna thank my friends to the right here and all of the folks that got us to where we are. This is a spectacular place to be. So thank you, thank you all so much for that, and we are gonna do you proud in the science mission. I wanna start off uh, just saying a few words about where we are and what we know so far. Uh, this is obviously not based on very much information, uh, and my phone is buzzing all the time with people telling me things, so we're already starting to process the information that we have, but in this first image, you can see that we landed to the southeast of the delta. We are about two kilometers to the southeast of the delta, and we are actually right on the boundary between two different geologic units. There's the kind of smooth area that we landed on, we call that the mafic floor unit. And then there's the rough area, this is actually where the dunes are, uh, and that's the olivine bearing unit. 
And uh, this is a great place to be because one of the things that uh, scientists love to do is look to see how two different geologic units come together. It tells you a lot about the geologic history. So we're, we're really excited to get going on this. Um, and if I could have the next image. Uh, so these images, I, I, I hope everybody understands that these are actually taken in only one of the color bands. This is just in the red color band. And they are actually taken through the protective lens cap that is on the camera. So these are, these are just amazing things that we got back in the first few seconds after we landed. Um, but we can already see some important things. Uh, there are rocks in this field of view. They are, uh, we don't know exactly how big they are, but they might be uh, about 10 centimeters would be a reasonable guess. Um, so those are, those are going to be very interesting. They will uh, undoubtedly be some of the first objects that we explore uh, once uh, the, the kind of shakedown phase of the um, early rover operations completes. And also in the background, we believe that we can see the delta. There, there are features in the back that look like the cliffs of the delta. And so when we get those additional images back that Jennifer was mentioning, we should know a lot more about that. And then we can also see um, some sand dunes in there. And, and actually, uh, in something of a relief, our imaging scientist told me when I went and talked to him about this image, I asked him what he saw, and he said, looks like Mars. And so I'm glad we have successfully landed on Mars. So science team is uh, really excited to get going here. We have uh, years of scientific investigation ahead of us. And I will turn it back to Jaru for questions. Okay, thank you, Ken. Um, we're about to start Q&A, so if you're a reporter on our phone lines, uh, remember that you can press star one and get into the queue. And if you're on social media and you wanna ask questions, use the hashtag Countdown to Mars. So our first reporter question comes from Steve Futterman of CBS News. Go ahead, Steve. And uh, congratulations to everyone involved in this. I'd like to focus my question to Matt Wallace and Al Chen. Obviously, we see you through the lenses of the cameras as this is happening. Could you take a step back and maybe describe for us what was going through your mind, your hearts, what were the emotions as the, the seven minutes of terror were taking place and the reaction when you knew that, that Perseverance had safely touched down on Mars? But, you know, it's hard to really describe, to be honest with you. You think you're prepared for it. It's part of our business in some ways. You know, we're exploring, we're going places we haven't been. We know there's risk, we know there's uncertainty. Uh, I was telling somebody the other day, I don't think a single workday went by for the last eight or nine years where I didn't think about entry, descent, and landing. You know, you always worry, uh, did you make the right decision? Did you test the right things? Did you put the right people in charge. We clearly did on Perseverance. Uh, but it just, um, it consumes you. It becomes part of you. And um, in, in some ways, uh, it, it's hard still to believe uh, that we finished it and that we're done. <laughs> you know, it still feels a little surreal uh, because it just becomes embedded in, in the way you, you think. Um, you have to be constantly terrified uh, of it. You have to respect it. At the same time, you have to somehow believe that you can do it or else you'd never try to put a car on the surface of Mars, right? It's crazy. Um, and so uh, it, it's, part of our, it's part of what we do, I guess. And at some point, um, it becomes part of how you think. Uh, but but there really is no good way to describe that moment when it's over and you hear those words, uh, touchdown confirmed. Uh, it's just a remarkable feeling of, um, of pride in the team, uh, relief, uh, and, um, and, and really joy thinking forward to this remarkable service mission that we have coming up. Uh, that's the best I can do. Uh, let, me, let me turn it over to Al. I mean, those seven minutes are still pretty raw for me right now. But the, uh, yeah, it, it's you know the vehicle is going on a roller coaster ride, and you are too, right? The the little pieces of uh, of data come back. Things seem to be working the way you want them to go. You know, you start getting, you start feeling good, and then you know something comes by that doesn't quite match what you thought it was going to be. Is that really right? You should have expected that, or something comes out of order, and your stomach drops. And then you know, okay, the things are okay again, right? And then you, you pick up that. Uh, Next piece of information that they, says things are actually going okay. Um, it's an emotional roller coaster ride all the way down. 
uh, that way. And you're, you know, you're second guessing yourself as you go, even though it's already happened. It's, it's kind of crazy. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's a, a feeling of being very fortunate at the end, I think for me, that uh, I get to work at a place with, uh, with, with people who are both great engineers and great people. And we still get to dare mighty things together. So, thank you. Yeah. Great, thank you. Okay, our next caller is Marsha Dunn of the AP. Go ahead, Marsha. Yes, hi, uh, congratulations. Uh, for Elle, um, all those blue dots surround, oh, sorry, all the red dots surrounding the little, little blue patch, are those mostly rocks? How close do you think you came from something that could have doomed the mission on landing? Thank you. We'll have to take a closer look at exactly uh, what we had there. Uh, I will tell you that in general, we make these maps a little scarier because we want to make sure that we find the safest spots. In fact, these maps are typically saturated at we, what we consider 4% uh, hazard, so that if you came down there, I mean, some of these places are definitely problems, but uh, and there's individual rocks that are marked there. Um, so we're gonna have to take a closer look to see how close we came. Uh, but we definitely, you know, the, the system did what it was supposed to do. It found the, uh, the safest area that was available to it and, and went there. Great, okay, thank you. Next call is from Paul Brinkman of UPI. Hello, yes, thanks for taking my question. Um, I'm wondering if someone can, uh, I realize you haven't seen the, the descent images yet, but um, to what extent do you expect any major changes in uh, Perseverance's, uh, Perseverance's planned route um, based on those images and um, about how much imagery do you think you're gonna get? I mean, in terms of the number of images or video and um, how much better will those be than, than what you have from the orbiters? Uh, I don't know if that would be for uh, Lori or uh, for Jennifer. Go ahead, Lori. Or, oh no, you're pointing to Jennifer. I think Jennifer would be Okay, go ahead, Jennifer. <laughs> well, why don't I, uh, I can talk a little bit about the images. Um, we think over the next few days, we'll get all of the entry, descent and landing um, movies down so that we can see basically that front row seat of what happened, all the different cameras, and we'll get those movies. I think as far as the where we might go once we see those, um, I can probably toss that over to Ken and see what he says about that. Yeah, I, I expect that what we will do is we will explore that contact that I mentioned between the Mafic floor unit and the, uh, and the Olivine unit. And as Jennifer mentioned, that's a dune field, and we may have to go around the dune field, but I, I suspect we will go around it uh, either one direction or the other uh, towards the delta. Great, okay, thank you. We'll take our next reporter question from Sam Ahmed of AFP. Go ahead, Sam. Hi, thanks for taking my question, congratulations. Um, we understand we, we had uh, two mics on board. When, when might we know if we are, if uh, Perseverance was successful in recording um, the first direct sound from Mars? Jennifer, you want to take that one? Yeah, I, we should be able to get some of that information in the overnight passes tonight and tomorrow morning. So hopefully we'll, we'll be able to understand whether we got the sounds and, and what those sounded like. Thanks. Great, okay, thank you. Next reporter is Kate Tobin from PBS NewsHour. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Wonderful, congratulations to the team. Great, great job. And, and my question follows on the last two about the, uh, about the imagery from, uh, from the cameras that you put on to the uh, descent vehicle and on the rover itself. Uh, can you talk a little bit, you, you say they're going to come down uh, starting tonight and overnight. Is that all of them? I know there were some GoPro type sort of rugged sports cameras that you had pointed in all different directions and some high speed uh, video that you were taking. Do you expect it all to come down in the next uh, you know, few hours or is that something that's going to trickle in over days and when do you expect to release it? So let's let Matt take this one. Go ahead, Matt. Yeah, I can give you a, a kind of an overview there. Um, and, and you're correct, yes, as I think Thomas mentioned or others have mentioned, uh, for the first time we're gonna be able to see ourselves in high definition video land on another planet. Um, we, we put uh, commercial ruggedized cameras at various locations on the vehicle, three of them looking up at that big supersonic parachute, one on the descent stage looking down at the rover, one on the rover that looks up at the descent stage, 
And then we have one at the rover looking down as well. And so we think we're going to capture some pretty some pretty spectacular video. And they come with a microphone as well. And so I think that's what you're asking about. Um, we are, in fact, hoping that we can bring one image, one still image from those cameras uh, uh, to the table uh, tomorrow from the descent stage looking down at the rover. And, and I think that's going to hopefully uh, we'll see that. And, and then um, I'm hoping that that's going to be a remarkable image. But the first video product uh, we're going to work on over the weekend as the imagery comes down. And we're going to try to bring that uh, uh, to, uh, to a press conference on Monday. And I think that's really going to be uh, something to see. Yeah, it's, it's going to be remarkable. I'm looking forward to it myself. Thank you. Thank you. OK, our next reporter is Stephen Clark from Space Flight Now. Go ahead, Stephen. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, just wondering if maybe Jennifer Trosper can go through the timeline over the next couple of days in some more detail about, you know, when the lens covers are going to be open, when the uh, high gain antenna will have a lock on Earth, um, and when the mast will be, uh, you know, deployed, and when the first drive might be. Uh, just walk me through that for me, please. And, and maybe for uh, uh, Dr. Zubrukin or Dr. Glaze, um, you know, the Mars sample campaign, sample return campaign was really hindering on the outcome of today. Just wanted to get your comments on, on any relief that you felt that, you know, that your, you know, your whole Mars sample return strategy um, is reality now after today's outcome. Thanks. Yeah, I'll start with uh, what, what we're doing over the next several SOLs. This is SOL zero. So right after the rover landed, it actually fired some pyros and did release our high gain antenna and also release those lens covers, which is why the images that we expect to see this evening will be without the lens covers. And those will be the HazCam images along with the other images we talked about. The, the first four or five SOLs, what we're trying to do is get the power, the thermal and the communications, the infrastructure of the rover stabilized so that then we can go and, and load the software, as I mentioned. So the, the first thing we'll do tomorrow, we actually gyro compass today as well to see if we can understand our orientation such that tomorrow on SOL 1, we can point the high gain antenna at Earth. And then if we get good pointing, then we'll start commanding the vehicle through that antenna. And that's one of the key things we're trying to do in these early days is get that communication link working. We'll also release the remote sensing mast. And then on SOL 2, we'll deploy that mast. Now, while we're doing these things, which I call our critical path infrastructure things, we're also doing other health checks of other instruments. And over the course of the three SOLs, or four SOLs of the, these early activities, we'll get all the instrument health checks done. We'll charge the rover battery. On that SOL 2, once we deploy the mast, that's when we'll take those initial images with our double E cams, these, their camera, their, their color this time. In the past, they've been black and white. We'll take those first panoramas. And then the mast cam Z, which is also on the mast, we'll take those panoramas on SOL 3. And then those, we'll be sending that data down along with additional data from the EDL cameras and the other data that we talked about over this week. It'll take us till about SOL 4. On SOL 4, we actually start to load um, and burn into the, the RCE, so our flight computers, the new software. And once we start to do that, we do about four days of transitioning to the new software. We do it very carefully. We toe dip. We make sure that nothing goes wrong. And at the end of that is when we start the next set of checkouts where we'll deploy the arm, we'll do our first drive about five meters forward and back. Uh, and then once we get that checked out is when we'll start to drive towards a heli site. We'll have figured out where we want to fly the heli. Uh, we need, there are certain requirements of, of that site in terms of rock sizes and flatness. And so we're looking for that right now. That ends up being, you know, a few weeks before we get there, but, uh, but we're excited about it all. I want, I want to quickly talk about uh, your second question, uh, Steven, and that is, uh, of course, uh, there's a lot of friends all over the world who had a sigh of relief when everything went well with this uh, touchdown. Uh, the Mars sample return uh, colleagues, they're all working really hard to re retire the risks of these new technologies and to bring together two of the most amazing missions to now bring the samples back. Uh, that's uh, work that has started years ago, technology development and, and the system development here at, at JPL, at the European Space Agency and elsewhere. 
There's two principles we used to set the timing. The first one is we always bet on success. In our business, even if you sweat through shirt or not, like I learned about uh, John, you know, we bet on success because that's what we want to achieve. Uh, that's what we're planning for. The second one is to go right now and develop the more sample return campaign. Not only makes the service mission more effective in that regard, but also it actually saves a lot of money because we actually can use the systems that we have now to move towards that uh, return. And so for that reason, I think uh, there's a lot of uh, people being excited right now all over the world. But uh, yeah, Lori, anything you wanted to add that I, I may have overlooked in this? No, I, I think you've covered that really well. The, the, the only thing I would say is that, um, you know, it's always nerve wracking to, uh, as we go through the, the EDL for a lander or a rover, um, but it was doubly so this time because, as you say, the, the Mars sample return uh, was also pretty, you know, re is, is reliant on the success of, of Perseverance. So, uh, yeah, we all definitely heaved a sigh of relief uh, in thinking forward on, on all the work that, that's to go uh, for Mars sample return. But really, really exciting that we've now really embarked on that chapter one of Mars sample return. Um, in for real, so it's great. Okay, thank you, Lori. Okay, we're gonna do a social media question. This might also actually be for Lori. Polls to do on Instagram asks, if Perseverance finds signs of past or present life, what would we do next? Oh, wow, that's a great, great question because um, there's still just so much to do <laughs> on Mars. Uh, it's a fascinating, fascinating place and there's, there's a, uh, it's a wonderful laboratory for doing incredible science. And, uh, you know, certainly the big question for us right now is this question about uh, the evolution of Mars and the, and the existence or not of, of past life that's been preserved um, at Jezero Crater. And, and that's our focus right now. Um, you know, but we're always looking forward to the additional science that we're going to do in the future, um, thinking about, uh, again, uh, how planets form, how they evolve, and, and Mars is a great, great place to, to work on all of those different science questions. Great. Thank you. Okay. We're going to go back to the reporter phone lines, and we have Mike Wall of Space.com. Thank you all, and um, yeah, congratulations. It was, it was a really great day for all of us watching, too. <clears throat> um, just. Just to kind of piggyback off of um, Stephen Clark's question about what the near future holds, could you maybe Jennifer or John or or Ken, like, um, do you go out like like another couple of weeks or a month or so? I mean, how long do you anticipate it'll take to get to the helicopter site, and how long will those flights take? And I mean, when will the rover be able to actually like start doing science and like start gathering samples and so on and so forth? Do you think? Thank you. Sure. I'll, I'll go a little further out. I talked about we'll have the uh, road. Once we get the robotic arm working and we get mobility working, we'll go find the heli flight demo site. So it's about three weeks. And then depending on how close that site is, uh, it, we have to traverse to it. And we still have the helicopter underneath the rover. So we can't use our auto, auto navigation. We have to be a little bit more careful when we're doing that. So it could take up to 10 solid. It really depends on where we find a heli flight demo site. Then we will spend 30 sols. A sol is a Martian day. It's 40 minutes longer than an Earth day. So we speak in sols when we're doing operations on Mars. So we spend about 30 sols um, for the helicopter demo. Prior to that, it'll take us about a, 10 sols to get the helicopter just deployed underneath the rover, move the rover away. We go about 100 meters away before we fly it. So that's another 40 sols. So I, I like to say it's, it's sometimes hard. To, it's always hard to estimate exactly when things happen, but we'll be flying the helicopter in the spring here, and we'll be spending spring flying the helicopter. After that, we're going to upgrade our auto navigation capability on the rover, meaning we're just going to try it out, make sure it works. Then we'll, we'll drive towards the first science site that Ken and his team are interested in going to. Again, that depends on where they want to go, how long it takes us to get there. And that's the point where we, where we will be doing the first sampling. So I like to say summer is the time frame when we'll be doing the first sampling. Those things can change. They might go faster. Uh, or if we have to drive, traverse to different places that take a longer period of time, it might go slower. That's a, a longer plan. And then one thing I'll just throw in the end, conjunction, uh, is around September where we um, do not, we're not able to communicate with the spacecraft because the sun is between Earth and Mars. And so during that time, 
we'll spend a little bit of work uh, finishing off some efficiency and operability capabilities for the vehicle to help it be even smarter and even more autonomous. And then after conjunction, we'll upload that new flight software build. And then that's when we can really do things even faster than we had originally planned. Ken, do you want to talk a little bit about the science part? Uh, yeah, it's a little premature to say very much yet. Um, I, I, I mentioned uh, in, a, in a previous discussion that uh, there are 450 science team members, and I, I think most of them are sending me texts and emails about what we should do now. Uh, but we've got to get together and actually uh, come up with a communal plan. We're not ready to do that just yet. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, the next reporter question comes from Jackie Goddard of the Times of London. Hello and congratulations everyone and that includes uh, all the folks on those screens at your kitchen tables and your, uh, on your couches with your dogs and your cats and your kids. Um, my question is can one of you on the panel please give us some examples of the complexity of the challenges that you faced um, getting this mission to Mars under pandemic conditions and to what extent will COVID continue to affect operations. For example, will the rover operations also be at their kitchen tables and sofas and pets on laps, um, or does that now change? Thank you. Yeah, I can, I can uh, start us off and say a few words. Um, I'll uh, let Jennifer say a, a bit about looking out into the future of the surface mission. Uh, you know, the pandemic struck at just about the worst time uh, for this mission. Uh, we had just shipped the vehicle down to Kennedy Space Center it was in pieces. We still had to put it together. It's a critical point in time for us. Uh, you can't make mistakes. There's no safety net at that point. There's no double checks. You have to do it right. Um, we were still finishing some of the flight hardware back here at JPL. Um, we had very little schedule margin. You know, the teams were already working multiple shifts and had already scheduled out the weekends and. Uh, you know, we had to react very quickly, and, and we were, uh, normally you're just focused on trying to do the job, do it right, and uh, get it done in time to make the planetary launch window, because if you miss it, you're gonna have to wait two years. Um, and, uh, and suddenly, the, we had to start thinking primarily about how to keep the team safe and their family safe. And, um, and how to get through all these logistical challenges. Uh, you know, we were, quickly trying to understand the protective equipment we had to bring in, um, what kind of social distancing we had to deal with, how many people could stand around the rover, and how close could they be inside a clean room, you know, what kind of protection we got from our clean room garb. Um, we, we were just struggling to understand if all of our support community, the, the companies that just clean the garments, you know, for our clean room, or bring the nitrogen in for our thermal vacuum chambers, whether or not they were gonna be there and continue to deliver uh, the things that we needed to keep, to keep going. Um, we had people here at JPL that had to travel to Kennedy Space Center and we couldn't get them, we couldn't travel commercially and so we had to ask for some help from NASA headquarters, our friends at Armstrong uh, gave us a jet to fly, uh, helped us with uh, uh, transporting via an agency jet back and forth. Our, uh, we got support out of Wallops, um, another NASA facility, to fl fly some of our flight hardware there and, and back. So it was a very, very challenging uh, time. And, and then we had to figure out how to actually launch the thing and, and fly it when you know, uh, we had all these constraints as well. Uh, we were modifying our processes and protocols in our operations facility. Um, you know, very, just very, very challenging. Um, you know, and the team, uh, I think that the team, like all of you uh, uh, out there, they're worried, you know, worried about their parents or grandparents and, and uh, just worried about w their kids out of school, worried about taking care of, you know, uh, kids at home and do, doing their work. Um, so it was, it was a tough time. We actually, um, we decided to try to market. We, we put a, um, a plate, a COVID plate on the port side of the rover. It's now sitting on Jezero Crater uh, you know, with, the, with the vehicle. Uh, and in the, and uh, you can see the video there of us installing that plate uh, down at Kennedy Space Center. 
uh, and that plate is really there to symbolize the challenge that uh, not just our team was facing, but everybody has been facing. Uh, it's been a tough year. It's been tough to do this mission uh, under these, uh, uh, in this environment. Uh, but the team, uh, like they have with every other challenge, has stepped up to it. We got a lot of help from the institution, from the agency, uh, and I think, um, and I think that's going to continue into the future so that we can do this surface mission. Uh, Jennifer, do you want to add anything? Well, I'll add that uh, we are not all together, and that's very unusual for a landing. And when we start a surface operations, Ken's talking about his phone blowing up. Usually that would be a big meeting that's in one of the buildings here on the laboratory where we all talk about what the, the science of the mission is and based on where we are, what we want to do. The engineering team is largely on site right now. Um, and to finish development was a struggle being remote because these are complex systems. They take a lot of individual expertise put, put together in a way that we can operate a vehicle, that we can build software that makes that vehicle work. And doing all of that remotely without as much uh, interaction has been hard for the team. We have the science team now is fully remote. And so, and you know, it's just like all of you guys. I mean, I work from my laundry room for the last several months, right? And my kids are in Zoom school and they'll walk in and then people say they can't hear me because the washer's going. I mean, everybody has these challenges that are, are going on because this is not the way we typically would design a Mars mission. Uh, but the team has been fantastic and just overcome every challenge. We actually have, we have now uh, robots on the floor where if you're remote but you want to go look in a room, you can log into one of the robots and you can drive it around the floor now in surface operations and, and go talk to the people that you want. So we, we've, we've learned a lot about how to do things remotely. I think it has changed how we think about the problem, but it is, it is challenging. Uh, and I look forward to the time. I think there will be a time. Uh, when we can all be together again and not have all the restrictions. I'm in a room by myself, which is the only reason I'm not wearing a mask. Uh, and I think that that does make it. Um, one of the things they the team missed out on a little bit was just that excitement and energy that comes from being all together right before landing. And so we were together, but it was remotely. Uh, and so I think it'll be fun and great for the team to be able to get back together again when we can do that. Okay, thanks, Jennifer. Uh, next call comes from Amina Khan of the LA Times. Hi, uh, thank you so much uh, for taking my call. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so um, I had um, a couple of questions here. Um, congratulations. Um, to, to jump off of that, that last question, I was sort of wondering if all these pandemic restrictions will be affecting um, how uh, you guys deal with, with Mars time. Will that be affecting the Mars time experience? And, uh, and also will it be affecting the experience of um, the rover drivers? Um, how will that be changing because of the pandemic? Yeah, well, the Mars time question is great. We, what, so Mars time, as you obviously know, you've asked the question, is, is uh, we get up in the morning on Mars and then our clock shifts by 40 minutes every day. So when you're all here and you're together, uh, that kind of works. But when you're sitting in your living room or you know in a small room in your house, if, if you need to be on a telecon all night long planning the rover's sequences for the next day, that may not work out for your spouse or your family or those things. So we've had to change. In some cases, we've actually had to create remote but on-site uh, places for people to come to. We don't want to gather too many people together. Uh, we need to have our socially distant facilities. But we have several, I would say we have a, a couple dozen people who are remote but still coming to lab to different areas during Mars time so that they can uh, not interfere with their family's life, which is not on Mars time. And then as far as our rover planners, they're going to get busy. It's, the, they uh, already have some meshes where they're trying to come up with strategic traverses uh, with the images we, we have. But I, I think it, it's the same for them. We ha they have some unique um, equipment they need to use. So again, we've, we've set up some different locations where they can come in and uh, use that equipment. It doesn't have to all be, we have some over in this building and then we've, we've set some up in another building. So rover planners who can't be at home on Mars time can come in. So it is, it is different and it's different for the families and we'll see how it 
we'll see how it works. Um, we do have probably about 50 people in here that when they work Mars time, they're actually at the facility and on console, as you see behind me. Great, okay, thanks, Jennifer. Okay, the next call comes from Leo Enright of Irish TV. Uh, thanks very much, uh, yeah. um, and uh, as we say in the Irish language, Cogordas uh to everybody involved, particularly the people on the Zoom screen, uh, many congratulations. Uh, I had a very detailed geology question ready for Ken uh, Farley, but uh, Jennifer Trosper mentioned a robot that they're using uh, to communicate, uh, I, I wasn't quite clear about that, so I thought I would ask about that a bit more. You said you had a robot that can move and talk to people? Let me, yeah, I'll clarify. It's a robot that you can log into and essentially drive it around and your face will be there and you can zoom up, or you can drive up next to somebody that you want to talk to closer than six feet and then uh, you can have a conversation with them from your... No, it's just a robot that moves around the, uh, I can't remember the actual um, maker, maybe somebody can help me out with that, but it's a, it's a robot that we drive remotely around the floor. It's, it really just has wheels and then a screen. It's a, a moving computer screen. Maybe that's a better way to describe it. <laughs> Could I do a follow-up? Sure, we can do that. We'll, yeah, sure. Okay, thanks. Because I did have a question for Ken Farley. Um, Ken, I, I, you know, as, uh, this Zoom screen is fantastic because we're all used to the crowd coming in in JPL after a landing. Uh, and the other tradition in JPL after a landing is, is the journalist with the geeky question. Uh, so I just wanted to ask you, could you clarify, uh, ha have you landed at Canyon de, Se de Chez? Uh, and if that is where you have landed, um, can you tell me whether you've looked at Channel Islands and the outcrop there that does appear to be a delta formation? And would you consider doing a quick run to Channel Islands rather than a long run over to the delta? Yeah, okay, so let's, let's uh, clarify what's going on here. So the science team has associated specific um, uh, earth locations, they happen to be national parks and preserves, to specific regions uh, in Jezero Crater. And it is from those quadrangles, we call them, those quadrangles on earth that we will draw the names that we informally attach to features that we look at and we take uh, observations of. So we have, in fact, landed in the Canyon de Chez quad. Um, and uh, the, uh, I'm not sure exactly where the, the feature that you were referring to is. I still think that our most likely ultimate destination uh, is going to be to the west-northwest and that we will very likely go up to the delta front that in, on the image you see right now is in the, in the upper left-hand corner. Okay, we're going to end on a social media question. So Vince on YouTube asks, was the landing today the best one so far? <laughs> uh, I'll ask Matt that question first. Yes, since I think <laughs> yes, 100%. It was the best one so far. Um, you know, I, this is my fifth Mars rover. Uh, Jennifer and a handful of other uh, others of us on the project have worked, uh, you know, uh, a number of these. and. Uh, it's, uh, they're all very, very special, I have to say, but uh, as of this moment, right now, this is the best landing <laughs> on Mars, I would have to say. All right, great, thank you. That's all the time that we have for questions today. Uh, if you're a member of the media and you still have a question, you can contact the JPL Digital News and Media Office. We'll continue to answer well, the questions. Well, it looks the like media. the show is TV over. Thanks for tuning in. This content was received from NASA. Come back next time. Goodbye.